North Korea is unlikely to give up all its nuclear weapons and has continued activity inconsistent with pledges to denuclearize, U.S. National Intelligence Chief Dan Coats said this week, apparently contradicting President Donald Trump's claims of big progress with Pyongyang. The assessment came just weeks ahead of a planned second summit between Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The American president is hoping for a big foreign policy win from the meeting. The DNI report said that in his 2019 New Year's address, Kim pledged that North Korea would go toward complete denuclearization and promised not to make, test, use or proliferate nuclear weapons. However, it said Kim conditioned progress on practical actions by the United States and added that Pyongyang had in the past tied the idea of denuclearization to changes in diplomatic ties, economic sanctions and military activities. A landmark first summit between Trump and Kim in Singapore in June produced a promise by Kim to work toward the complete denuclearization of the divided Korean peninsula, but progress has been scant. Our assessment is bolstered by our observations of some activity that is inconsistent with full denuclearization. Chinese President Xi Jinping has watched a performance by North Korea's art troupe in Beijing, state media reported. The art troupe kicked off their visit at the invitation of China, state broadcaster CCTV said. The troupe was led by North Korean diplomat Ri Su-yong, a vice chairman of the ruling Workers' Party's Central Committee and director of its international department. China has sought to remain front and center in diplomatic efforts over Pyongyang. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un met with Xi for the fourth time earlier this month, ahead of Kim's planned second summit with U.S. President Donald Trump. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un plans to make greater use of coal to boost the economy, but burning coal may pose a threat to his people, who are already breathing some of the world's most toxic air, while the world is turning its back on coal for clean air. At a time when a global trend is phasing out coal, in his New Year's speech, Kim said coal is a primary front for the country's economic self-sufficiency. With international sanctions in place, North Korea's coal exports have been blocked and Pyongyang is turning to increase coal output for domestic use. Nearly 50 percent of North Korea's electricity is produced by its seven coal power plants and one oil-fired plant, with the rest coming from hydropower, according to South Korea government data. For households, coal is a key fuel source for cooking and heating. The reclusive country's mortality related to household and ambient air pollution was the world's highest, at 238.4 per 100,000 of the population, a 2017 report from the World Health Organization, WHO, showed. That was 10 times higher than that of South Korea and even higher than those of China and India. Despite the harmful impact of air pollution, it is hard for North Korea to be coal-free in the face of harsh sanctions, and for many North Korean people, food security comes as a more urgent task to contend with on a daily basis rather than the air they breathe. Reports acknowledge the country's air quality had not been fully assessed due to limited technical and financial resources. Even worse, additional pollution could spill over to South Korea as up to 20 percent of South Korea's air pollutants are known to be originated from North Korea, experts say. Air pollution is the biggest concern for South Koreans who are more alarmed by air pollution alerts than North Korea's nuclear threats, a 2018 study by a state-funded think tank showed. Recognizing the need to ease environmental concerns altogether, the leaders of the two Koreas promised last year to restore the North's damaged forests, which have been a factor in increased risk of exposure to air pollution, flooding and crop failures. Experts say knowing North Korea's air quality is essential to devise South Korea's air pollution policies. Myanmar's parliament has voted to further discuss a proposal by the ruling party to change the constitution in the biggest challenge in nearly three years to the military's power over politics. The proposal could add to tensions between the military and Aung San Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy, NLD, which have been at loggerheads over the charter since the party's historic landslide election win in 2015. Parliament Speaker T. Kun Myat said the chamber affirms and accepts the discussion on the emergency proposal to form a parliamentary committee for amending the constitution. He also turned down an objection by military lawmaker Brigadier General Maung Maung that the proposal breached procedure. 
The surprise bid to reform the constitution comes as both civilian and military leaders face growing international pressure over an army crackdown on Rohingya Muslims in 2017 that sent about 730,000 people fleeing to neighboring Bangladesh. Tourists across China flocked to Harbin, capital of northeast China's Heilongjiang province, to experience the charm of winter, boosting local tourism and winter sports. A three-dimensional light show was held at the Sun Island International Snow Sculpture Art Expo Park. Colorful lights featuring different stories were cast on the snow sculptures, drawing a big crowd. Some scenic spots have launched many activities featuring Russian styles, attracting tourists to visit Harbin to experience the exotic charm. Since the 35th Harbin International Ice and Snow Festival was launched on January 5th, the Harbin Taiping International Airport has received more than 30,000 passengers every day, with the passenger load factor hitting 90% in flights coming from Beijing, Chengdu, Chongqing, Xiamen and other major cities. The number of tourists from Singapore, Russia and other foreign countries increased by nearly 10% over the same period last year. With the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics approaching, people are paying more and more attention to winter sports. And some professional winter sports are even able to be enjoyed in shopping malls and amusement parks. The Wonder BMW Snow Park, the biggest indoor ski resort in the world, covers an area of 80,000 square meters, has six ski tracks with different slopes, and can serve 3,000 people at the same time. Although curling was introduced to China quite recently, curling has become a fashionable sport in Heilongjiang province. A local curling hall, which opened on June 30, 2017, has received more than 300,000 visits, and now there are nearly 10 professional curling halls in the city. In addition, various winter sports competitions were held to attract domestic and foreign tourists, such as a winter swimming competition, an ice sculpture competition, an ice fishing competition and an international ice hockey competition. China's railway system saw a surge in passengers as citizens began their trips back home for the Lunar New Year, which falls on February the 5th this year. Over 10.47 million trips were made via railway last Sunday, up 16.9% from last year. The Guangzhou Railway Group transported 1.9 million passengers Sunday, up 26% year-on-year, or an increase of 380,000 passengers. It also increased 262 trains bound for Hunan and Hubei provinces in central China and Sichuan and Chongqing. Railway operators in Wuhan, Nanchang and Xi'an increased night bullet trains to the Pearl River Delta and the Yangtze River Delta. While the railway experienced a surge in passengers, the yearly motorbike brigade, composed of migrant workers heading back home by motorbike, dropped a little this year. According to official figures, each year, more than 100,000 people ride motorbikes from South China's Guangdong province to South China's Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region during the spring festival travel rush. The number used to be 5,000 to 8,000 a day, but in recent days the number has only been about 3,000 to 4,000. Experts explained the opening of the Nanning Guangzhou Railway and four expressways between Guangxi and Guangdong offered more choices for motorcyclists to return home. The spring festival travel rush started on January 21st and will last until March the 1st this year, during which railway trips are expected to hit 413 million in total, up 8.3% from a year ago. Hundreds of millions of Chinese will return to their hometowns for family reunions during the Spring Festival holiday. Ancient towns in East China are immersed in a festive atmosphere as the Chinese Lunar New Year or the Spring Festival approaches. In the centuries-old city of Buzhou in East China's Anhui province, 18 streets of the Ming, 1368-1644, and Qing dynasties, 1644-1912, have completed their makeover to relive their former glory with not only festive delicacies, but also all kinds of non-tangible cultural heritage objects on display, such as paper cuts and traditional Chinese food. The five animal exercises, or Wu Qin Zi in Chinese, invented by Hua Tuo, one of the greatest doctors more than 1,800 years ago, is now popular among people in the city, just like square dancers. 
In the ancient town of Anchang in Zhejiang province, which has a history dated back to the spring and autumn period, 771 to 476 BC, people are busy preparing preserved meat for the coming new year. All kinds of preserved meat and fish are now hung along the streets, creating a unique landscape. The Chinese Lunar New Year falls on February the 5th this year. In the Cambodian capital of Phnom Penh, around 500 of the city's poverty-stricken landless have defied their superstitions and chosen to live amongst the 200 tombstones in a cemetery. It's a ghost town where the living far outnumber the dead. Sun Ramali moved to Smor Sun, a slum built on a cemetery that is still visited by relatives of the deceased when her old home was swept away into the Mekong by floodwaters around 16 years ago. Many other families have been sharing space with the dead since the 1980s, but the cemetery dwellers no longer believe in ghosts. The cemetery slum is across the river from Diamond Island, the jewel in Phnom Penh's fast-rising skyline. Four decades after the genocidal Khmer Rouge regime abolished private ownership and destroyed all land records, Cambodia is in the midst of a property boom. At the center of the land rush is Phnom Penh, which is undergoing a complete makeover. Almost all of Phnom Penh's slum dwellers are landless with no claim to where they live. Although the residents of Smorsan have not been told they will be evicted, the telltale signs of impending development are all around. And there have been overtures from municipal officials offering to relocate the cemetery families who don't want to leave their unusual homes. If you're into gaming, you may want to check out a new eSports center in Mong Kok, which has recently opened. Chief Executive Carrie Lam officiated at the opening ceremony. She joked she's not the most trendy person for the task, but talked up the economic benefits of the eSports industry. Apart from providing financial assistance, she said the government plans to introduce a licensing mechanism for the trade. Around 1.2 million gamers are expected to flock to the new venue at McPherson Place each year. A 25,000 square foot eSports center. Computers equipped with the fastest graphics card available on the market, along with live commentary during the live streaming of games. Cyber Games Arena is located in Mong Kok in the heart of Kowloon. Bringing video game tournaments to the city to a higher level, the facility claims to be the largest integrated esports stadium in Asia. And the masterminds behind the project? Last year, they also received some $50 million in private funding. At the basement, there is a stage that can host events along with 150 spectators. Also, a paradise for virtual reality lovers. Players will be able to get a taste of horror or action-themed games. The arena expects to host at least 150 esports events each year with an estimated 1.2 million visitors. This is where the magic happens. Only for the ladies. The arena also prides itself in having the city's first female-only compartment, hoping to attract more female gamers. French Spider-Man Spider has been at it again, this time in Manila, as astonished crowds watched on from below. 56-year-old French climber Alain Robert scaled the 47-story GT Towers this week without a harness, ropes or any kind of safety net. Free climbing has been a hobby since he was just 11 years old, and it's led him to climb more than 150 skyscrapers worldwide. Paris, London, Havana, Jakarta. The list goes on. In 2011, he scaled the tallest skyscraper in the world, Dubai's Burj Khalifa. While Robert may have the climbing skills of a superhero, he's not completely invincible. After his descent, he was promptly arrested by authorities and driven away by police. Conservationists in Australia are using a semi-autonomous underwater robot to deliver baby coral to damaged areas of the Great Barrier Reef. 
Microscopic coral larvae were first collected from healthy corals during a recent mass spawning event and then raised in special enclosures. When ready, the scientists transported these heat-tolerant coral larvae to a site damaged by mass bleaching where they were delivered directly onto the Great Barrier Reef by Larvalbot, developed by Queensland University of Technology's QUT robotics team, led by Professor Matthew Dunbarbin. According to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, the pilot larval restoration mission is a world first. Larvalbot is an evolution of his Rangerbot robot that he developed to help control the coral-eating crown of thorns starfish. Larvalbot is assigned a pre-programmed route with an iPad used to activate delivery of the larvae. Dunbabin likes it to spreading fertilizer on your lawn. While it has only been tested on a small scale, the team calculated that a single robot could cover 1,500 square meters per hour. Its current capacity is around 100,000 coral larvae per mission, but the team says they want to scale up to the millions. The scientists are now monitoring the progress of settled baby corals with plans to refine the technique and scale up in the coming year. The Great Barrier Reef, covering 348,000 square kilometres, was World Heritage listed in 1981 as the most extensive and spectacular coral reef ecosystem on the planet, according to the UNESCO website. Climate scientists warn that rising ocean temperatures are harming tropical corals at unprecedented levels. Bleaching occurs when the water is too warm, forcing coral to expel living algae and causing it to calcify and turn white. Mildly bleached coral can recover if the temperature drops, otherwise it may die. New Zealand motorists using Wellington's Mount Victoria Tunnel may have to put their horn tooting days behind them as City Councillor Chris Calvi Freeman lobbies to put a stop to drivers using their horns. Calvi Freeman added that the honking was annoying for pedestrians and cyclists who share the tunnel with honk-happy motorists. The tradition of honking in the tunnel started in the 1930s as a tribute to a young woman who was murdered nearby, according to local media reports. Residents were divided on the beeping, with some saying it connects people, while others said the sound on top of the exhaust fumes is not cool. The New Zealand Transport Agency is currently considering whether to add new signage to the tunnel to encourage motorists to not use their horns. I feel like it's a gauge of the city, like when, when it's honking it's during a good day, it's a Friday or Saturday, and so you just avoid it that day, and then, yeah, that's no, not cool.